And what we're doing is trying to figure out whether or not the phrase originated from the Bible. The phrase we have this morning is one that I think we've all heard at, at one time or another. Maybe your mom or your dad said this phrase to you. But uh, the phrase we're looking at today is this. Cleanliness is next to godliness. Cleanliness is next to godliness. Now, um, I'm just going to ask my wife not to vote. Because I know some of you have been watching her to see what she votes for. And then you just copy her. And uh, I'll be honest with you, that's putting a lot of pressure on my wife. So she's not, she's not going to vote today. So you can't look to her for an answer. I mean, really, this is, I mean, it's just for fun, whether or not you think it's in the Bible. And what I have discovered is that when you participate, you, you learn things a, a little better. So I, I hope you don't feel um, bad participating. I hope you feel good about it, even if you don't get it right. Usually it's about 50-50 each week, so, you know, half of you are wrong, half of you are right, right but, but we all learn something through this. And so the phrase, uh, cleanliness is next to godliness. Who says that phrase is in the Bible? See some hands? Who says that phrase is not in the Bible? Who is like my wife and not voting today? <laughs> well, the phrase, cleanliness is next to godliness. You know, I really wish that phrase was in the Bible because I would quote it to my children chapter and verse on a daily basis. But the phrase, cleanliness is next to godliness, that phrase is not found in the Bible. Now, it was first written uh, in English by Francis Bacon back in 1605. That's the first time we find it in, in English writing. But it really became popular when the founder of the Methodist movement, John Wesley, preached about it in one of his sermons. Back in 1791, this is what John Wesley said. Slovenliness is no part of religion. Cleanliness is indeed next to godliness. Now, unlike some of the phrases we've looked at that aren't in the Bible, and I don't even think have a biblical message, I think you can argue that this phrase is, is at least the content, is biblical. And I actually want to give you two illustrations of, of how I think the content, the meaning behind this, is biblical. I want to give you an Old Testament illustration, and then I want to give you a New Testament illustration. First of all, looking at the Old Testament. Cleanliness or purity, was very important to the Israelites. We find this throughout the entire Old Testament. Their purity laws, their, their codes of cleanliness were very important to the Israelite people. And one of the reasons why it was so important is because this was one of the ways in which they distinguished themselves from other nations. This was one of the ways they distinguished themselves from other religions. And it was a daily reminder that they were children of God. As they followed these purity, purity rituals, as they followed these laws of cleanliness, daily as they followed them, it was a reminder to them that they were God's children, that they followed the one true God, the God who was pure, the God who is righteous, the God who is always perfect. And so it was a distinguishing factor for the Israelites. That's one of the reasons why they followed these purity and cleanliness laws. Now, as we know, the, uh, the Super Bowl is, is next Sunday. Um, any, any Seattle Seahawks fans? Anybody rooting for Seattle? Wow, a lot of people. Anybody rooting for the cheaters? Any, any New England Patriot fans? Thank you, Tim. We appreciate you. Anybody like me, I don't like either team. I mean, honestly, I, I hope it ends in a tie. I don't like either the Seattle Seahawks nor the New England Patriots. I, I hope it ends in a tie. But here's, here's the thing about that Super Bowl. At least if they follow what they've done in the past. In the past, these, these, last, these last few years, for the Super Bowl, okay, a dress code violation, the minimum fine for the Super Bowl, for a dress code violation, the minimum fine is $100,000. A dress code violation for the Super Bowl, minimum fine of $100,000. I kid you not, if you wear your, if you wear your socks too, too long, it's a $100,000 fine. 
If you wear your socks too short, it's a, it's a $100,000 fine. You have to wear your socks exactly like the NFL tells you to wear them, or it's a $100,000 fine. If you write on the side of your shoes, hi, mom, it's at least a $100,000 fine. I hope your mom appreciates it if you do that. Before the game, the, uh, the teams have to, have to send to the NFL what they will be wearing on Super, Do- Super Bowl Sunday. And if, the player, and if any player goes out onto the field and is, and is not wearing exactly what the team said they should be wearing, it's a minimum of a $100,000 fine. Of course, last week, right, Mar- Marshawn Lynch, the NFL took this uh, one step further with Marshawn Lynch. Marshawn Lynch was going to wear these shoes up here onto the field for that game last week. Gold, gold cleats, gold shoes. I, I guess it cost him, those shoes cost like $1,200 to, to make for Marshawn Lynch. But Marshawn Lynch was going to wear those shoes out onto the field, and what the NFL said to him was, forget about the fines. If you, if you try to wear those on the field, you're going to be kicked out of the game. You will not be allowed onto the field if you wear those shoes. Now what the NFL dra- is trying to do here, the NFL is trying to, to make a brand, right? They're trying to make a brand. They want to distinguish themselves from other leagues, from other sports, so that when you see them, you know it's not the Canadian Football League. You know that it's not the NCAA. When you see them and their players, you know that it's the National Football League. And they want the players to know that they play for the National Football League. Because they're creating a brand. They're distinguishing themselves from other sports, other leagues. Well, that's exactly what God was doing with the Israelites. With these purity laws, these cleanliness codes, he was distinguishing them from other people, from other nations, from other religions. So that when people saw them living up to these codes, the other people knew that they were followers of God, the one true God. But I, I, I would also add this, that just as I think the, uh, the NFL has gone a little too far with all these laws and regulations with regards to the uniform, the Israelite people went a, a, little, a, little, a little too far, a tad bit too far in keeping up these, these laws and regulations when it came to purity and cleanliness. Because for the Israelites, ultimately, the laws of purity and cleanliness, they became an end unto themselves. The religious leaders, they were more concerned about their people following these laws than loving God. They were more concerned about the the, the people keeping these cleanliness codes than than loving their neighbors. So much so that when we get to the, the New Testament, Jesus has a thing to say to the religious leaders about cleanliness and purity. And we find that in the book of in the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 23, verses 25 through 28. Here Jesus is speaking to the religious leaders of his day. He says, Woe to you, teachers of the law, who are the the teachers of the Scripture. Woe to you, teachers of the law, and Pharisees. And the Pharisees were religious leaders within Judaism. He says, You hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. In other words, you, you, you teach your people to follow all of these purity laws, yet inside you are selfish, yet inside you are greedy. Jesus goes on, he says, Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside will also be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. He's he's saying, you're you're like a beautiful mausoleum. You're like a beautiful tombstone. You look great on the outside, but what do you find inside a tomb? What do you find inside a mausoleum? You find bones. Bodies that are dead. And that's what Jesus is saying to the Pharisees. He says, in the same way on the outside, you appear to people as righteous. But on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. You're full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Jesus. 
I believe, was much more concerned about the purity and sincerity of our hearts than the purity of our hands, clothes, or homes. When you look at the New Testament, when you look at Jesus, I think you discover that Jesus was much more concerned about the purity and sincerity of our hearts than the purity of our hands, clothes, homes, or even sanctuary. Now, now for my children, <laughs> for other children who might be here this morning, I, I don't want you to take that in a wrong way, okay? <laughs> don't misunderstand what I'm saying with all that. I mean, I, I still believe for, for Jesus it was, you know, it was important to, to look after your body. After all, they, they are temples of God. Our bodies are temples of God. Jesus is still concerned with us being good stewards. We need to be good stewards of our homes. We need to be good stewards of this church, of this sanctuary. But for Jesus, none of these things, none of these things were more important than loving God and loving your neighbor. I think, I think of that story that we all learn in Sunday school, those, those guys who brought their paralyzed friend to see Jesus. And they get to Jesus' house. They get to the place where Jesus is living, and it's just packed with people. It's so crowded that they can't get inside. And, and so what do they do? What do they do? They climb the roof, and on the roof they make a hole. They dig through the ceiling, and it's so big that they can lower their friend on a mat to the floor inside. I mean, imagine the mess that that made, right? Imagine the mess. They, they just dug through this ceiling. And so there's probably dirt and straw and, and a bunch of other stuff just l laying on the floor inside Jesus' house. I mean, they made a huge mess. But how did Jesus respond to their vandalism? And that's what they did, right? I mean, they vandalized his house. How did Jesus respond to their vandalism? Did he take them to a small claims court? Did he reprimand them? Did he say, you know what? I expect you to clean this mess. <laughs> No, basically he applauded their efforts. Well played, well done. And then he actually healed their friend because of their faith. But again, you just, you just can't discount, dis, discount being clean and pure. You know, when my, my kids tell me they can't clean, right? When my kids tell me they can't clean, you know, what they tell me is, you know, I, I don't have time. I don't have time. And by that mean, you know, I, I don't have time. I'm playing my, my Xbox right now. I, I don't have time. I'm, I'm watching Netflix right now. I don't have time. I, I'm busy doing nothing right now. Never has one of my kids come to me, and, and they've, been, they've been forewarned about this from the first service people, but never have my kids come to me and said, hey, Dad, I'd love to clean right now. I'd love to help you clean, but I'm really engrossed in what Paul is saying in the book of Philemon. <laughs> I'd just be really happy if they knew there was a book called Philemon and that it was about a slave and his master. Never have one of my kids come to me and said, hey, Dad, I'd love to clean right now, but I have a friend who's going through a tough time, and I'm praying for him. They've never done that. They've never done that. And so, yes, it's, you know, it's important. These, these bodies are, 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 are our temple. We are to be good stewards of our homes. We are to be good stewards of, of this church. But what Jesus is saying is that none of those things are as important as loving God and loving our neighbor. As a matter of fact, in, in Matthew 23, that word hypocrite, in Greek, it literally means one who hides behind his mask. One who hides behind a mask. That's, a, that's what that word hypocrite means. You see, in ancient Greek, in, 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 in the ancient Greek theater, oftentimes the performers, the actors, had to play more than one role. They had to play more than one character within the same play. And so they oftentimes wore masks depending on the character they were playing. Even in the theater today, you know, the symbol of the theater is the, these two masks of, of tragedy and comedy. Where the, where that, well, where, where that idea comes from is the ancient Greek theater. 
And if it was a really good actor, you know, at one moment they could be playing a, a, a tragic character and they'd be wearing this mask of tragedy and they would make you believe that you were that, that, that he would, or she was that tragic character. I guess it would all be teased. And then they'd turn around and put another mask on and they'd play a comedic character. And they'd make you believe that they were that comedic character. Well, that's where this word hypocrite comes from. Us portraying one thing, but, but on the inside we're, we're somebody totally different. Hypocrisy, it means just playing a part. And I think as Christians, you know, we have, we have to ask ourselves the question, what lies behind our proverbial masks? What, hi, what, what do we hide behind the masks that we portray to others? You know, we might portray that we've got everything under control, but inside we're a mess. We might portray to, to others that, that, we, that we are righteous, that we are following God's commands, but on the inside we know we are not. What are the masks that we wear? And believe me, we all wear them. We are all hypocrites in one way or another. I mean, ultimately, the church is a place where, where hypocrites, hypocrites go to be healed and to be set free of their hypocrisy. What are the masks that you wear? As I've been thinking about that this week, I thought about the church in general, the church as a whole, right? Not just faith church, but the church as a whole. And I think that, that maybe the greatest hypocrisy we face as Christians is professing with our lips that we love Jesus and we love our neighbor. Yet our actions, yet our actions do not show it. We say we love Jesus, we say we love our neighbor, but then we turn around and we gossip about that coworker. We gossip about that 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 person in school, or, or, or we gossip about our neighbor. We, we say we love Jesus, but then we have that biting remark, that biting word to someone close to us. We say we love Jesus, but then we simply don't take the time to try to figure out what is going on in someone, someone else's life so that we can be the light of Jesus to them. Rather, what we do is, you know, we immediately judge them by what they wear, or what they say, how they speak. Wouldn't it be amazing, wouldn't it be amazing if we could hear the cry of their heart? If we could see what, what they were going through, you know, I, I think we would treat them differently. If we truly tried to understand, if we truly tried to hear, what was going on inside of someone else's heart. A couple months ago, I was at a, a district event, and the district superintendent, Larry Whitehead, showed a, um, showed a video. It was actually made and produced by uh, the Cleveland Clinic, so it was actually done by a hospital, but I thought it applied to the church as well. And I want to show you this, uh, this video created by the, uh, the Cleveland Clinic.
know, the amazingly good news of the Bible tells us that that God heard our cry and that God sent Jesus so that Jesus could walk in our shoes, so so that Jesus could see what we see, so that Jesus could feel what we feel, so that Jesus could go to a cross and then three days later arise so that we might have victory in this world. And he also came so that we might be his light. So that when we see the people around us, we will see them not as the world sees them. That we will see them as God sees them. You know, the, the, the statistics just tell us that there are marriages here this morning who are stronger than they've ever been. But also that there are marriages here this morning who are falling apart. Statistics tell us that there are those of you who are here this morning and and you are healthy and you are fit, but also that there are people here this morning and you are hurting. You've just gotten bad news from the doctor. Statistics tell us that there are people here today, you're at the height of your career. But then there are others of you who you don't even know where your next paycheck is coming from. calls us to look into the heart. What I, I want, what I want you to do, okay, just for a moment, I just want you to look around. Don't, don't say anything. Just look around into the faces of the people sitting around you. To your left, to your right, in front. Don't be afraid to look behind you. But look into the faces of those sitting around you. Right now. Look into those faces. You may know their names. You may not know their names. You may know their situations. You may not know their situations. But even for those you don't know their names, right now, we're just going to take a few moments. And I want you to pray for those people around you as the Spirit leads you. Pray, pray for them. That they may know the redeeming love of Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, our family. We do pray for those around us. Even though we may not know their situation, we know that you do. And whether it's a broken relationship, whether it's a a bad diagnosis, whether it's financial problems, whether it's spiritual problems, And so, maybe it's been a long time since they've heard your voice, but but whatever it is, dear God, we just pray for them from the depths of our soul, asking you to lift them up, that you would heal them, that you will place them on a safe place, that you will stand beside them, because you know how we feel. You've seen what we've seen. You tasted our death. You nailed sin to a cross. Heal us this morning, and may we be the people you've called us to be. May we be one in spirit, so that just as you look in our hearts, we may look into the hearts of those around us. God, we thank you for these many things. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand with me as we join together in our closing song?